here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is the C86 Show. I'm David Eastall. As you know, we love a special guest. This week it's going to be the turn of modern English because I recently spoke to their guitar player. It is the one and only Mike or Michael Conroy. To find out more about life, love, poetry and all the other groovy stuff, the band are still very, very happening. And if you want to find out any more information... They have a very good website with lots of information, but uh, this is the interview. So um, after several minutes of interesting but casual chat that we edit out, I know, drastic, uh, we get down to that exciting subject that was the early formative years. Michael, it's over to you. Well, uh, do you know what, then? I was was born in 62, so it was, um, you know, I went from Slade to um, uh, David Bowie, you know, with, when I was, got my first um, uh, LP at Christmas, it was, uh, I asked for Aladdin Sane. <laughs> and um, yeah, the same review, I thought um, all B-sides, but like Velvet Goldmine uh, and uh, Roxy Music, yes. you know, uh, I thought um, they were uh, the kind of bands that I was into. Uh, then I... Um, you know, I mean, I went to boarding school in Wolverston, just outside Ipswich, and uh, right. it was a boys' school. And um, you know, there was all different types of music going on all the time. <laughs> so, you know, from um, you know, when you're eleven, close to the edge, you know, Yes and Genesis and uh, all of that stuff. But generally, the consistent thing was, um, without a shadow of a doubt, David Bowie, <laughs> and then right. then punk rock. Punk rock came along and it kind of, you know, if you like David Bowie and Roxy Music, you're instantly going to like um, The Clash and Wire and X-Ray Specs and, you know, Live at the Roxy LP, yes. don't you remember that? Oh, yes, yeah. the great yeah. version of O oh, Bondage Up Yours, which was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, you know, of course, um, you know, John Peel was, uh, you know, he, he was the main uh, person around that time, um, you know, we all listened, everyone listened to, you know, and there was, you know, like the local record shop, our um, keyboard player, Steve, worked in, so did I actually, in Power Records, which was like an independent record shop. And um, you pretty much would just buy every single punk rock or new wave right. records, you know, as it appeared, there used to be a list on the side of the counter, you know, and it, <clears throat> you'd think like, you know, what's, um, you know, Chinese rocks, 12 inch, you know, it's like, I'll find out in a half a minute and then I'll take it, buy it and take it home, you know. And it was basically John Peel and like, you know, local record shops and concerts, you know, we were lucky in Colchester. Yes. Because was- we had Essex University and, uh, <clears throat> you know, for a pound, you could see, you know, Susan the Banshees, Human League and Spitz Energy all on one bill and um uh, yes, uh that's um, quite handy wasn't it really i, I mean you, the first uh sorry i was gonna say did you did your were your parents at all musical did they have any sort of influence on your sort of musical direction at that kind of early age not really my dad used to like johnny cash and uh glenn campbell and neil diamond my dad was in the army i mean colchester was a you know an army town <laughs> and uh you know so it was um you know, uh, you know, they were from a different era. It's country and western, and the Dubliners and the Clancy brothers. Right. You know, yes. Was, my mum, my mum used to like the Rolling Stones. I think she um, was, you know, she thought Mick Jagger was um, incredibly attractive and slightly rebellious. But there was no, um, uh, you know, no massive um, kind of like. You know, I, I, I've got um, three sisters and a brother, and we were all into, you know, all of us were into music. My parents, they had more, you know, other things to worry about, you know. Yes. Those days. Well, I you guess know, being in the army. Um, but yes, well, there was a lot of children too. And where do you sort of fit in that? Because I'm I'm the youngest of three, and there was a bit of an age gap between my two older brothers and me. So where do you <laughs> sit in, in the sort of family sort of... I, I'm just the second, second, second oldest. Right. My brother is older than me. And so, you know, it's like when, when you have an older brother, 
as well. You kind of, um, you know, you can, you know, go through, you know, what they, you kind of choose what records you want to get. You know, you get this, I'll get that one. Kind of thing. It's, well, it's uh, interesting because my, my older brother was seven years older and he, he was obviously the oh, 70s okay. was his period and it was prog rock. So all those albums, you know, Close to the Edge, Topographic Oceans, you know, the, the whole Genesis, Barclay James Harvest, Wish by Now. So he... And he was very anti-punk, you know, which was a bit unfortunate in later life because obviously it would have been good. But I know the work of the solo work of Rick Wakeman instead. So and um, John Anderson and Steve Harrow, because I kind of thought that he was cool and um, I was quite young and um, we were in the countryside. So we didn't have that cultural stuff that went on. So unfortunately, um, punk didn't really happen. It doesn't happen in, in the, you know, in the countryside of East Anglia, does it very quickly? It was status quo, bit of heavy metal, you know, bikers, denim jackets, you know, yeah. and, and a bit of heavy yeah. metal, really, at the disco. It was it was kind of quite grim, really. <laughs> yeah, right. <clears throat> we 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 played um in Norwich uh in about 78 opening for the undertones and uh uh you know it was still kind of like um you, you know there's uh, people from Norwich wanted to go and fight people from Colchester <laughs> basically uh, you know the punk rock gigs it was we we came off covered in spit you know people were just spitting at us you know which was like the punk rock thing to do they thought uh, yes I mean, so when did you when in, did you, in, i was going to say when did you get a guitar oh um <clears throat> when i was about 15, 14 15 i um uh, got a guitar for um uh, my mum got it for me actually in the local uh, corner shop there was a sign saying guitar for sale and uh <clears throat> it cost 10 pounds and uh, my mum didn't know this, but uh, you know, inside the um, Roxy Music for Your Pleasure album, mm. where they, each member of the band's playing a guitar. This guitar was exactly the same guitar that Brian Eno had. So, uh, you know, I kind of like thought, wow, this is incredible. My mum's bought me a guitar like exactly the same as Brian Eno's. So, uh, but I, obviously, I couldn't um, do what Brian Eno did. You know, it was. Um, bar chords, learning how to play. This is the thing about punk rock when it started. The idea was that um, anyone could do it. So it was like learn to play, um, you know, <clears throat> a pretty vacant, God save the Queen. If you could play the bar chord, you you were away, you know. Yes. So, um, you know, I, I couldn't do it. I mean, it's, you know, in those days, it was like, you know, Steve Howe and, you know, all of that lot. They were kind of like way out there. and you know, genius guitar players. And then punk came along and it said, actually, um, you know, if if the song's longer than three minutes, three and a half minutes, it's, um, you know, boring and dull. So um, it was easy for young people to um, learn how to, to, you know, to, you know, join in. Yes. And when, can you remember your first gig? Or was it the Susan the Banshee uh, one? No, uh, the first gig that we played. No, the first, the first gig, gig you gig went to. Bebop Deluxe, uh, uh, Ipswich Gaumont. Right. Yeah, yeah. Mine, yeah. Actually, mine was at the uh, the Gaumont scene Nine Below Zero in about 1980 or 1979. So it has got fond memories, really. When you go to your first gig, it all just seems rather exciting and um, huge and loud. And um, yes, nothing's the same again, is it really? So when you got to 16... I mean, oh, sorry. Yeah. I was no, going to no, say... No, come on. When do you when you got to sixteen? Did you leave school at that stage, or did you go to college, university? No, 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 no. I left school, and um, I mean, I <clears throat> with um, modern English. We, they originally, the, they were called the Lepers. Okay, you know, punk rock, and the uh, first gig was with the Banshees and Adam and the Ants, and then um, shortly after that, the um, uh, guitar, the bass player left the original bass player. And then I joined, and um, uh, when I was fifteen, so my first gig was um, opening for Sham Sham sixty nine when it was like the you know hardcore skinhead type thing. So a bit of a baptism of fire, and uh, <laughs> I um, then you know we we just um, started to get more gigs, and uh, I was 
kind of go to the technical college in Colchester, but I kind of, you know, I um, got a job in the record shop. It was a bit like, you know, work in a record shop or um, go to uh, college and, you know, spend more time, you know, being able to be in a band and rehearse and also get paid yes. as well. That's amazing, actually. At that stage, because that was, I suppose you're getting towards the late 70s. So the the post-punk yeah. period was kind of starting to um, develop because there was, you know, when you mentioned Adam and the Ants, had Marco Peroni joined the band by then? No, no, no. This was, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 Johnny Bivouac. I mean, I, I'm a bit of a train spotter here. I can remember the names. And uh, uh, Andy Warren, I think, from um, who was either in the monochrome. I think he joined the monochrome set afterwards. Right, the bass player. And um, but I think the um, the drummer Dave Barberi, he ended up in Bow Wow Wow. And then you know this was like pre Bow Wow Wow and all of this. I mean, the ants were. I, I didn't at the time. I don't think any of them even had record deals. You know, they were just kind of, um, you know, bands that you'd go and see. I mean, Adam and the Ants, they used to hand out um, in those days, um, they had um, uh, pamphlets that they used to hand out with all of the, you know, crazy, you know, um, ant music for sex people, imagery and lyrics on everything. So people would kind of, you know, there was uh, kind of, you know, a bit of a, I, they were like a kind of punk rock Grateful Dead, I suppose. They had like a <laughs> hardcore following. Yes. And they used to, there was a guy who used to make a fanzine called Xerox as well. Yes. Who, and so that was all dedicated to the ants. I mean, it, there was in those days, it was like, um, you know, Sniffing Glue, the fanzine that Mark Perry, who later on became um, ATV, you know, Alternative Television, who were also... Uh, a band that I really liked at the time, you know, and they had already, already <clears throat> ATV and Wire had already kind of like <clears throat> gone away from like two and a half minute hardcore punk, you know, thrash to um, kind of more, you know, um, you know, ex you know, they were kind of exploring, you know, within their, uh, their abilities of what they could do. I mean, if you listen to the first Wire album, you know, there's, um, you know, one, two, X, U on there. And then there's also, um, you know, kind of like slow songs as well, which w weren't really punk rock at all. But, yes. Um, you know, well, I've was... always got fond memories of Wire because I remember sort of going yeah. from that period of prog rock and serious music, which my brother had, to sort of John Peel hearing I'm a Fly in the Ointment and being like, that's a that's not topographic. This is not beautiful imagery. This is not sort of Rick Wakeman going off on one or Chris Squire going off on one or all of them going off on one. It was just like I'm the fly in the ointment. It was just very, oh, that's this is a different kind of I've just walked into a different space here, haven't I? So it was going to be a different, a, a different journey. And I was just kind of curious, because curious with the Adam thing, because because I don't know if you've heard. The exciting news, but there's a man called Rima Rima who did one. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Rima yeah. Rima. Well, there's suddenly been this huge amount of interest because Dorothy Max Pryor has just written a book about her period at 69 Exhibition Road, which is kind of yeah. that kind of late yeah. mid 70s to early 80s. And then there's some persons made a film about Rima Rima, and there's the kind of the mysterious Marco Peroni who's who then sort of gets headhunted almost by Adam and leaves the band, yeah. which leaves the rest of them wondering what to do, so they quit. So that's the end of that. So you're, you, well, became, uh, you know that sorry. kind of story. Yeah, so you know that story oh, well. Oh, yeah, well, um, they, um, I mean, that's an amazing record, Real in the Roses. I mean, they, um, uh, that, that was on 4AD. The first record. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so um, Ivo, we, 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 we'd stopped being the lepers and we uh, uh, we did some demos and we uh, became, um, you know, we thought this is crazy. You can't send demos to people called the lepers. And uh, so we changed our name to Modern English and we sent um, sets to everyone. And Ivo uh, um, and Peter Kent, who um, they... Uh, 
but worked in the record shop at Beggar's Banquet and Earl's called the so the record company was upstairs, like a couple of telephones and a desk. And the record shop downstairs, they um contacted us and uh, uh over a period of time uh we ended up on 4AD, but our first gig was in Deptford at the Albany Empire. Right. And it was basically with Rima Rima, except Marco had left by this time it was uh mick um the bass player gary and, and um the singer and um mark cox and i don't think max was there but um it, it, so of course they ended up being max and the wolfgang press and all of that i, I mean i that you know i yeah yes. Marima, they were kind of like i mean that record was incredible absolutely amazing record and then they split up i mean the, um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm here. I haven't been able to see the film, but it was definitely on my um, radar. Yes. Well, I, I think you'll like it. And it's kind of, it's got all the members apart from Marco. And then Dorothy's got this book as well, which is also a bit of a page turner that highlights a lot of that kind of story of all these bands who were, <laughs> were so interchangeable. So then, so modern English, it was the late 70s, early 80s. Yes, the the period where Thatcher gets into power and then we have a conservative government for a million years. And then the next next yeah. couple of years, we have the, 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 the Falkland War, the miners, you know, the, um, kind of rioting. There was also Greenham Common. So it was kind of a quite a politically kind of murky and heady time, wasn't it? So how, how did it sort of affect the band at this stage, knowing that um, so, so much was at stake? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, during that period, I mean, when, when we um, signed to 4AD, we, um, uh, you know, we lived in Colchester. We kind of like did our, um, you know, uh, forming of the band and playing, you know, incredibly out of tune concerts around East Anglia and the odd one in uh, London. <laughs> that was when we um, signed to um, uh, 4AD, we, you know, suddenly we were playing with like Rima Rima, you know, even though they weren't Rima Rima and Bauhaus and uh, playing at the Moonlight Club and the Rock Garden. So we moved my brother and his mates who, um, you know, it was old school friends who <laughs> lived in a squats in uh, Notting Hill Gate, right? Lap of Road, and uh, which was a completely different place in those days. It was like rubbish skips everywhere, and people like doing up houses. And um, one of the few shops in that area was Rough Trade Records, next to a cafe called the Favorite Cafe. But um, so we all we lived in. Um, uh, you know, we were squatting basically. But, you know, in in those days where, um, you know, on the dole, you, you know, with uh, absolutely no money whatsoever, but a rehearsal space around the corner that several of the other local, I mean, our next door neighbours for a period of time were um, killing joke, right? In, uh, yeah, in Lancaster Road, just off Portobello Road. There's, um, you know, a lot of. Um, uh, a lot of uh, musicians and art artists and, you know, the Clash kind of Apocalypse Hotel down in Latimer Road. Were, so it was um, a cheap place to live for um, bands. But, um, <clears throat> I, mean, we, we, the, I mean, like you said, everything was, I mean, you know, black and white, <laughs> you know, the TV, <laughs> you know, we didn't, you know, we just didn't have any money. We, I mean, some houses we didn't even have hot water. You know, we used to have to go to Lab of Grove uh, swimming pool for a yes. weekly shower. A know, weekly but, shower. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, They're probably but, definitely not a was, washing machine. L life in a laundrette, that was always a nice experience, wasn't it? An yeah, 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 yeah. And doing laundry. But um, <clears throat> it, 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 thing is, you know, it, when you we were young, it was still you know we were still kind of like um you know the, optimistic about what we could do as a band, but uh, you know it's it's strange now you know when you kind of like occasionally you'll see a list of like twenty goth albums, and you'll see our, the first modern English record in there, and you think you know. It, you know, it was, it's you know our, our, our clothes were from a Kensington Market or charity shops, <laughs> you know. As I we we weren't um, you know goth. It was um, 
you know, like Bauhaus and Joy Division and, um, you know, Gang of Four and the Mekons and bands like that, that and Monochrome set. You know, it's like if, if you, um, uh, you know, had a black and white record sleeve, people now think that you were being goth, whereas yes. at the time, you know, you were just thinking, well, it looks quite cool. You know, it makes a change from all of the kind of like Roger Dean, you know, <laughs> artwork. <laughs> yes, it definitely all over the place. And also, you know, if you haven't got washing facilities in your little house, it uh, it saves them to um, sort of worry about washing if there's no white clothing. So um, you just never gonna, you're never going to wear white, are you? You know, it's like it just isn't. I think it was Throbbing Gristle. I'm not sure where they all lived in the same house and they put all their clothes in a in a box and you know they just picked whatever was there in the morning in one of those kind of. It was almost like a cult, really, wasn't it? I think a lot of those sort of bands. Yeah took it to quite, quite yeah, yeah. extreme really so um you yeah. might well, well we, we i mean for um even up until our third lp we all lived in the same house you know we, we you know we ended up with um, a housing association you know from squatting but um you know it, i mean you know in Lambert grove and holland and um Notting hill gate the houses are quite big you know and if there's vacant building you could like get you know the, there was, uh, I mean, t- two of the guys from our school uh, ended up being, well, three, actually, at the band Colourbox, who uh, oh, right. we always lived as well. Yeah, my brother was, I mean, their manager. And I was in the year with um, Stephen, and my brother was in the same year as Martin. So, you know, we, and there was another band called Ski Patrol. I don't know if you remember them. They had a great song called Agent Orange. Which um, now, uh, you know, if it came out now, people would say it was kind of, you know, it it could easily come out now. But um, so they lived with us as well, and uh, a guy called Trevor Herrian, who he had a band called the Fallout Club. That um, he, um, you know, I mean, he he was working with uh, some uh, keyboard player called Thomas Dolby at the time. Right. <laughs> you know, <it's>, but <laughs> it was. It, it was, um, you know, basically we, we we kind of like write in the house, and you know, it was, there was always, um, you know, music going on in the house in the houses that we lived in, but there'd just be like different bands kind of getting their, um, you know, their ideas together. Yes, because one thing that you mentioned a bit earlier was John Peel, because I realised during that time, you know, we had these quite exciting gatekeepers or very important gatekeepers. And John Peel, obviously, when you listen to him at that time, you didn't think many other people were in the world. But now I realise how kind of important his kind of show was and what a network it was. And there was also three weekly music papers. And there was also every town and city in the UK had an alternative indie night you know, which, you know, again, help people yeah. sort of just get their little transit van and um, discover all the little sort of highways and byways of kind of the the uh, road network around um, the UK, really. But it kind of also made people feel like they were progressing somehow because because obviously, you know, they, especially the 80s indie scene that, that I've been a bit obsessed with, there is a sort of five-year narrative, isn't there? They sort of, the 12-month honeymoon, the John Peel, you know, John Peel plays the first single, you get the John Peel session, and then suddenly you're thinking, well, it's a bit like a, a board game, isn't it? Go go to next place, oh, buy it, get a record, you know, go to a label, you know, do the studio, get that first album, things going well, second album, not sure, sure, third album, totally disastrous. So, I mean, that's that's kind of, you know, a, a simplistic view of it. But you, again, you know, it was 24-7 with most bands and obviously with Modern English it was the same, wasn't it? You were just churning out albums after albums in that early part of the decade. Yeah, well, <clears throat> we... Um... We, we, I mean, we, it, 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 it took a bit of a return after. I mean, we did the first album. I mean, you know, we, in, in those days, it would be a bit like, um, uh, you know, you don't put any singles on the LP, you, you know, because you feel like, like you were saying, you know, you want an interesting B side or something like that to happen. And um, we um, uh, did did the first album and it, it like you said i've never heard you know thought of it before but it's like a board game you know it's like then you play in paris you know when you when we were young it was like all of these things were like you know you know the idea of actually going to florence to play a concert was 
you know, not something that you thought of when you were like in a transit van, you know, uh, broken down outside Coggershaw, you know, or, you know, Bedford coming yes. back from... And I think in, wherever in, the, and in the 80s, you know, the passport, you, I think you get a one-year passport, you just go to the local post office, didn't you, and just wait in right. queue. And we'd just kind of get yeah. this very papery little passport and go, oh, I'm, I'm going to Europe. But you wouldn't bother get anything more elaborate if you were working class because you think, I'm never going to go abroad again. So <laughs> I don't want, to, yeah, don't yeah. want to be too optimistic here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it was... Um... It, it was Peter Kent who, um, at 4AD, he um, had uh, friends in Belgium and uh, he um, uh, one day said to us, you know, we were talking about, you know, what what we were doing. And he said, do you want to play in Belgium? And we were like, yeah, you know, of course we want to play in Belgium. And, uh, you know, he kind of, <clears throat> you know, he organised it for us. And it was, um, you know, it's, it was all, you know, part of, um, you know, I mean, we had no idea, you know, what they, even then 4AD didn't really know what was, you know, in store for them. You know, it was, um, you know, trying to, um, you know, make records on as small a budget as possible. You know, it's like, I, I mean, I, sometimes I don't know how they did it. You know, it was like there was everything was like to the last penny. Yes, you know, I could those, imagine. I, th I think yeah. when they brought out that their first year, I think it was them. From the film that I, I saw, I think that was when they released the most, I don't know, album single in one year in their whole existence. I think they did something quite a ridiculous but optimistic amount. But I think that's when you're young, you can do that stuff. But then when you did your yeah, second, yeah. Uh, the second album, which followed, was it um, Mace and Lace, that your first one? Mesh and Lace, Mesh and Lace was the first album. <laughs> we did, I mean, that, that was, um, uh, we did that in two weeks in, um, uh, that was in a residential place in Surrey, where, uh, oddly enough, talking to Robin Gristle, there was um, uh, Ken, I forgot its name, Ken. Anyway, uh, a guy who was um, uh, ended up being in Psychic TV, uh, <clears throat> engineered the album. So his ideas were um, quite um, uh, interesting as well. And, uh, you know, that was kind of, the album was um, kind of like, uh, you know, we, we basically Ivo said we've got a week. Ivo came. He, he spent the entire time there. He said we have a week to record it and a week to mix it. You know, whereas before you'd go, we used to go to Spacewood in Cambridge, where loads of bands went, yes. where you could go in and record the A side and the B side and get it mixed within twelve hours. You know, so you'd thrash it out, and uh, so um. You know, we figured that we'd uh, try and do the same. Well, that we, you know, we didn't figure anything. We said that's the amount. And Ivo said, "This is how much we've got to spend, and how much time." You know, money was just all about how much time and what we could squeeze in. Yes, when it. you and, went, um, you went when you went to space. Was it Space Word or Space something in Cambridge? Was that space when they was yeah. were they was that in their house or had they moved out by then and gone <coughs> somewhere somewhere yeah, no, else? No, it was in the house in the. The studio is in the basement. Yeah, I, and I did an interview then, with the guy uh, who ran it. Um, he was now, I think, in Spain. So I just remember Mike. Thinking, Mike Kemp uh, might have been. Was, him. Was yeah, because there was him and the guy called Gary Lucas, but not that Gary Lucas who played guitar with right. Jeff Buckley. But um, yeah, because right. I met a, there was a guy who was in a I don't know an LA band called Jellyfish, and he he just he turned yeah. you know, he mentioned about that studio and saying that he just would listen and buy or well, I don't know buy but get every record that came out of that kind of particular you know studio he just was obsessed with it so um it had a special quality so he would he would have loved yeah. it so yeah. I mean it, I mean we um did uh our uh gathering swans on we did our first um two four eight. in fact we did our first three we did all of our first three singles at space were two in the house and the third one, they'd um, bought us an old village school, some just outside of Cambridge. You know, they kind of when they went expanded and went a bit, you know, big. But, yes, um, it was a t tiny, tiny studio. But um, the guy, I mean, I think his name is Mike Kemp. He was, he was just a really nice bloke, and uh, he kind of he seemed to know exactly what to do. 
<clears throat> you know, turn on the echo machine at the right time to make um, something kind of a bit more interesting. I mean, I, I think, um, I think you know, Pat, Gang of Four did their first EPs there. Uh, I think the Mekons, lo- loads of people would go for, come from all over the country to go to um Yes, yeah. but then, but then on your second album, which is After the Snow, you go to the famous Rockfield Studios, which we we love that documentary in the countryside. Yeah. So, what was your experience? How long <clears throat> did you spend at Rockfield looking at the um, uh, the lush grass? Yeah, uh, we um, uh, oh, uh, Hugh, Hugh Jones had uh, just done Heaven Up Here by Echo and the Bunny Man. Hugh Jones produced it. And uh, we, um, I mean, obviously it was a great record. And for the second album, I, I think after what we'd done so far, Ivo wanted us to be a bit more, um, um, you know, cohesive and, uh, you know, tighter. And, uh, you know, so he, um, you know, we looked around at producers. We didn't really know what a producer did. And Hugh Jones was top of our, our list. And he um, uh, came to... See us play, and we um, re- really got on with him. And he said that um, he, you know, he used to be an engineer at Rockfield before he became, you know, started producing properly as well. He kind of, and he lived in Wales at that period. And he said we should, you know, part of his working, you know, system was to in those days was to go to Rockfield, cut, you know, be cut off from the rest of the world, and just um, get on with it. But um, we did. Um, pre-production in London and then so that we knew exactly what we were doing then when we got to Rockfield it was um like you say you know um uh you know being from a you know squats in Labbert Grove to this amazing kind of beautiful um uh, farmhouse in in Wales and it it really did um <clears throat> you know it's like after a day or so you're kind of you are uh you know in the country again Yes, <laughs> it was um, you know there were sheep and horses and uh, views and rivers, but uh, you know we were we we didn't uh, we, in Monmouth. I think Market Day was on Tuesday, and um, we'd get I've forgotten the guy's name. The two brothers, yes, he, he, had a, he had a Rolls Royce, which we thought was like the height of, and get in that car and drive into town because on Market Day, of course, the, the pubs were open all day long. So um, that was um, like the day we'd go into town and then go back to Rockfield. And, um, you know, we were there for six six weeks. Amazing. I God, you must have blown the budget on that one. I completely. I mean, it was, um, I, I, poor Ivo was, um, I, that was the first time Ivo had actually kind of used, um, you know, like a proper producer in a proper kind of like, I mean, there was two studios. There was us in one, and Robert Plant was in the other studio. So you know, it gives you an idea of how um, you know, kind of you know, you think of Robert Plant, you know, spending a fortune on records. And I think I, Ivo is really, um, you know, he really wanted us to kind of like crack on, not go out, which we didn't really, and uh, you know, get the record delivered as you know on time as possible i mean we, 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 he virtually was uh, towards the end he was kind of like you know calling up you and kind of shouting at him saying you know you've got two more days that's it you know and hugh i mean bless him he'd uh um, you know we were fed in the studio but we we lived in a house and uh, hugh was having pretty much all of his meals delivered to the mixing desk you know coffee and roll-ups and you know eating his uh lunch or dinner you know whilst still working he never stopped that guy yes he, he absolutely didn't stop. he was it was uh, amazing you know i mean if hugh jones was um you know a massive influence on us you know he um from you know mesh and lace it was all all of our early stuff it was all kind of like songs that we just joined parts together you know with hugh even though we, you know, we knew how to, you know, write songs, but we we'd go off on our tangents. She would kind of rein us in and say, "Okay, this is, you know, time to bring the verse back in, or the chorus." You know, yeah, and, I mean, also every, it's amazing. 
Everybody I spoke to who's worked with him has just got lovely fond memories, but, you know, can't believe how he managed to survive on such a poor diet and no sleep. Oh, I see you've heard this before. (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, it was one of those, you know, and then sort of I think he's still alive and it's like, wow, that's, you know, because it did sound like everyone was... You know, all these much younger bands were still thinking, you know, who, you know, when you're young, you can do that. But when you're older, it's quite unusual, isn't it, to be able to live on such a poor diet, no sleep and, oh, and cigarettes. And, um, uh, he, he, he's still a really good friend of mine. He lives in Cornwall now. He's um, lived there for probably about 20 years. And uh, every now and then I, um, uh, you know, a joke with him about you know he, you know but do you fancy doing working with us on this he always says i've retired <laughs> <laughs> yes. he, he, uh, and and i had uh, i i've got a small studio space in just outside woodbridge and uh hugh came to, it, i mean he, he's given me some of his old equipment that he used to use in those days like his revox tape to tape machine yes and his whole um ac um 30 box amp so I've, I've got some of hugh jones's like stuff that was he made amazing records with but he came to my studio and uh, he said you know he he said it smells like a recording studio and i said did you fancy doing some work and he said can you smoke here and i said no he said no <laughs> <laughs> oh uh, you know if you can't smoke he doesn't want to work, you know, but you know, he's, oh, that's, a, he's, that's amazing. He's done his time, yeah. He has yeah. definitely done his time as the 80s progressed. And you'd sort of because your follow up album, Rick, uh, was it Ricocheted Ricochet Days? I mean, this, I mean, yeah. obviously, you were still at Rockfields and back there again, so Ivo must have been quite pleased. I mean, how was the band coping though? Because obviously. Um, yes, things can get a little bit tricky with any dynamic and especially the pressure of sort of record sales and money. So, and and it being the mid eighties, I sort of realized with most bands, they start to struggle when they realize there's another crop of bands coming through and they're slightly being nudged out and the fans want the latest thing. So how were you coping as a sort of a unit? I mean, I I mean, I mean, when we did, after the snow. I mean, with Mesh and Ace, it was kind of like, you know, it quite might, small, you know, it was like we were a, a new band on an independent label that not many people knew about. But with um, After the Snow, um, there was uh, um, a, this show in um, a radio show in um, a station called WLIR in Long Island in New York. And they were kind of like changing their formats, okay, from, a, you know, like rock or whatever to um, kind of this stuff that John Peel was playing. Uh, and, you know, there was uh, bands like Culture Club were happening and Duran Duran and um, amazingly, Flock of Seagulls were like really big. And uh, they had this, this guy had this show called Off the Boats and he'd play um, kind of New Wave records. Yes. And he he played um, I'm Out With You, from um, which uh, we'd released as a single in, in the UK. It didn't do anything. And uh, played it as an import. And um, it, um, suddenly that song kind of, um, uh, you know, it, 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 whatever was happening in that song, people really liked it on that radio station. And uh, then before we knew it, Seymour Stein and David Geffen were calling up Ivo at 4AD, saying, you know, we want to sign this band, Modern English, to uh, our labels. So, of course, we went with Sire, who um, had Talking Heads and the Ramones. And um, so then it was like things completely changed for Modern English. We um, suddenly um, uh, were basically playing in America all the time, and uh, MTV had just started at that time as well and we made a video for i melt with you cost two thousand pounds yes and um it was on the he- basically heavy rotation and it, we you know we went from um playing we played the um ica the new year's eve 1984 kind of big brother thing with you know bands like um you know the lemon kittens and um the books and the room and 
you know, clock TVA type bands. And the next gig we did was in um, <coughs> uh, Florida at Spring Break, which we didn't know about, but it's kind of, it's, uh, you know, like we're all college kids go on their holidays. You know, so the, so we went from um, the ICA to playing, um, you know, one night Bon Jovi were playing and then the next <laughs> night it was modern English. And the, the, the thing that made it even more surreal was the opening band for modern English were the members, you know, who I'd kind of seen a hundred times and got all their records. And it was like, surely there's a mistake on the, um, you know, but suddenly modern English had, um, you know, we were like all over the radio and all over MTV. And um, we were part of, um, you know, in a very small way, this um, new thing that was called the, you know, the British invasion. You know, we yes. didn't know what the hell was going on. You know, it was like, and we we were on um we were touring for um pretty much like six months. You know, we'd done like four gigs in Belgium, and suddenly we were like, you know, playing concerts every night in Cincinnati, and you know, we'd been played every single town with a college in America, and uh, you know, and more. <laughs> so it, it was interesting the, about the 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 flock of seagulls because I I remember I don't know five six years ago going to I don't know something like what Las Vegas and hearing you know the I ran I ran to you by the, the flock of seagulls and I couldn't work it out and then someone said oh when MTV started they didn't have any videos but this band from England had a video so they went oh that's great we'll just put it on and it will just be played a lot because until everyone else catches up with that culture. You know, yeah, so yeah. It, it kind of got embedded in the DNA of America. So, so I don't because frankly, I didn't take them that seriously. I shouldn't say that. But. I mean, they they um they they originally signed to a Bill Nelson's record label, Cocteau Records, right? Bill Nelson, you know, back to the bebop deluxe thing. You know, Bill Nelson started his own label, and they were one of the bands. And I used to go and see Bill Nelson play. And Flock of Seagulls were quite often the opening band, and they were nothing like, you know, that I ran. But having said that, you know, from um, you know, you know, from people to think of Gathering Dust by Modern English or anything off the first album to the second album, you know, when Hugh Jones got involved, we um, you know, there was a, a development in our sound, basically. Yes. You know, you know, earlier you were talking about David Bowie. One of the things that I really liked about David Bowie was that each record sounded like a completely different person to my young ears. You know, young Americans to um, station to station to um, low. You know, is you know, it's like three different bands, really. You know? Yeah, no, it's interesting. Kind of... I mean, now it all it all seems very good, but you know, Bowie was amazing in the seventies because he did one album a year. And produced several other albums for people like Lou Reed, Niggy Pod, and did several films. But it was the fact that he got a new lineup for each, nearly new lineup for each of those albums. And you're thinking, there was a lot to sort out and then write the material and tour. I don't quite know how he managed to um, juggle quite so many things, plus a drug addiction and, um, you know, relationships. <laughs> but but it was quite it was quite boggling, really. So when you got to sort of 85, 86, you were doing that, you know, your fourth album, Stop Start. Did it feel like the band were beginning to sort of wobble a bit? Oh, majorly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'd lost our um, keyboard player and drummer and acquired a new kit. It was all... That we, I think... Um, uh, we, and also we kind of lost touch a bit with 4AD. You know, Ivo would um, come out and see us, you know, play, you know, opening up for Tom Petty and, you know, the Stray Cats at like a baseball stadium in um, San Diego and think this is a long way removed from, you know, Rima Rima or, uh, you know, what he was, what was going on. I, I mean... The colour box were um, uh, signed to 4AD by this time. So I was signing more bands, but uh, so we were, um, you know, it, it, everywhere we went, there were representatives from Warner Brothers, you know, who owned Sire. And it was almost like, um, you know, we, we, 
it, it, it was like a, a, a diff, just a completely different thing, you know. It's like you know, with um, at Four AD, it was um, you know still that that kind of DIY type yes. thing. I, I don't think uh, that um, you know. I mean, we were young as well, you know. It's like you know, it, there's your tour bus, there's your hotel, there's you know, do do what you want kind of thing. And then so um, we we um, left Four AD and then just signed directly to uh, Warner Brothers and of course Warner Brothers <clears throat> you know we were we were a bit naive you know Warner Brothers they all they wanted was an album full of I Melt reviews you know like and we, we still kind of had um you know we weren't capable of doing that and huge we so we worked with um a, a different producer the one that Warner Brothers wanted us to work with and uh, uh basically it was ridiculous, you know. The, we went to Martin Russian studio. It, right. Martin Russian was to um, produce the LP with uh, his uh, this guy called Stephen Stewart Short, and it was obvious from the very beginning that Martin Russian was incapable of, you know, spending any time outside of the pub. <laughs> well, it's funny because 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 last well last week yeah I did an interview with the uh, singer from Wasted Youth who got an experience in Ken. Martin. Ken, you know, Ken Scott, I know him. And he was saying that Martin was kind of laying on the floor and occasionally they'd ask him something he'd say, oh just just move move that slider up a bit and then just kind of collapse again under the desk. <laughs> he said it it wasn't a very good success a good a good session you know the air I listened to it and it was all right but he said that you know Martin was just laying on the floor sort of just pointing and saying move the move that up or move that down a bit while he went and collapsed again you know and um yeah I mean, he um I mean he was a lovely bloke you know so he was um you know like in Goring in Thames where his studio was he was like the king of the hill and uh you know everyone in the pub loved him because you know he brought all of these bands you know Depeche Mode were there at the same time but um uh he you know he he, he kind of like have a, a bloody nose and a black eye one day just you think oh, okay you know <laughs> you know I don't know what you know what is going on but um so I mean that that album was um chaotic I mean I uh you know it's not I I don't even it's I don't even think about you know that <laughs> that 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 record it was um you know just the complete and utter you know just throwing money into um you know the, the you know the, the studio you know they had all of this new technology you know like fair lights synclavia and we we had to um you know employ a guy in the studio in the studio just because you know all of this te new technology no one knew how it worked except for um uh, Hazel O'Connor's brother, <laughs> as it turned out, who used to be in a band called The Yachts. Yes, The Yachts from Liverpool. Yeah, yeah. Waikiki Beach Refugees was their, uh, uh, their song that John Peel played. But so he, he, he was a real boffin. And um, so we made this record that, um, you know, if you listen back to it, you think, how the hell are we going to play that live? You know, it's all, um, you know, uh, program drums and even program bass guitars you know that um it, no I, I i mean i don't have much uh, fondness for that record it was just kind of like mega reverb and um you know it's almost sounded like a soundtrack for miami vice <laughs> <I thought. laughs> Yes, it was a disappoint, disappointing days. Then, do you have a few years in the wilderness trying to sort of navigate your next next move before you reform again? Don't you to record another album in the early nineties? Yes, um, uh, I, I actually uh, I, I lived in New I was living in New York for a while, and um, just uh, not being part of uh, modern English. And uh, then I went back to England in about nineteen nine, no, about nineteen eighty eight. So for two years I lived in New York. Then I went back to um, uh, England. Basically, uh, we'd um, kind of not split up. We just me and me and Robbie are like the the two who were like consistent then. 
And then um, we, um, you know, as these things happen, you, you know, got a phone call from um, uh, 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 someone that worked for our management company. He was working at a new record label called TVT, who had uh, just signed up um, uh, Nine Inch Nails. Oh, my God. Nine Inch Nails. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. there's, there's that famous bit on that documentary the beats with john jimmy iovine where he just hassles that guy to sign over nine inch nails doesn't he how did yeah, you yeah. Fi- how did you yeah. find working for such a a label tv tvt um I mean, it was wild the guy that in the label was um uh i mean i mean he, he, he i don't think he'll ever listen to this but he was a complete megalomaniac you know he he kind of like seemed to think that if he had a record label it would make him you know, he was more interested in making himself famous than he was, <clears throat> you know, his uh, bands that he signed. Yes. You know, he, he, he'd say, I've got all of this press uh, lined up. And you'd think, you know, good, he's, um, you know, working. And it would be like his own press, you know. <laughs> it would be like him being interviewed about his label. But uh, so, I mean... That, but you know, it, and also, I mean, he, all he wanted was um, uh, to to reissue "I Melt with You," basically, and uh, you know, we uh, kind of um, said, oh, you know, we'll do it, but you know, we we'll write a, an album as well, which uh, we did. I mean, and again, that was um, you know, we we didn't learn, you know, from the last thing. We kind of like just spent loads of money, well, with his money. And um, kind of like didn't come up with anything that was really that incredible, you know. It was, we were we were still a bit lost, you know. I mean, that at that exact time, it was all um, acid house was happening and um, stone roses and happy Mondays and all of this. And um, you know, there was um, you know, for us it was a bit like just a way to continue doing what we um, you know, being in the band, but you know. We, you know, we did, we we worked hard at it, but it just wasn't um, the most satisfying. I mean, I certainly don't, I mean, if, if I was, uh, if the house was on fire, I'd leave Stop Start and Pillow Lips in the house <laughs> and uh, <laughs> take, uh, you know, the first few records instead. <laughs> is, is that the kind of, after that experience, did you then, again, was that the end of the band for another <laughs> period of time? Yeah, well, uh, it, it was for me. Then I, um, I mean, I, I ended up joining, um, uh, you know, I, you know, lots of other friends. I, I ended up joining Stereo Lab, as they they just started in 1991, and Tim and uh, and uh, Russell, who was in a man called Moose, who was a really old friend of mine. So I was I joined Moose as well. So I was kind of like. In modern English, one day, and then the next day, I was playing in Stereo Lab and Moose, and um, did uh, you know that was really good fun because I didn't have to kind of like uh, uh, worry so much about writing any songs because yes. you know I was like uh, you know the keyboard player in one band and the bass player and keyboard player in another, and it was able to yeah you know, I'd never actually really played in a band before. Where other people, you know, it was their band. You know, with modern English, it was always like, you know, always has been like my, my band. You know, so. It, and did it, you ride um, that sort also, of Brit pop world at all? Was that sort of did Moose get into that little scene for a bit? Well, kind of. You know, it was they. I mean, they, they, I mean it, you know, the, the expression "shoegaze" was first Ooh. written in. In a moose review, yes, you know, because you know, staring at their pebbles, you know, so so you could make the most distortion and fuzz and all of this. I've forgotten the guy's name. It was, I mean, a couple of people have claimed that they came up with it. Andy Ross at Food Records, and uh, such journalist, I can't remember his name, but yeah, I was, uh, you, you know, did uh, about. Um, three LPs in bits and bobs with Moose and toured. I, I used to kind of like be in Moose for a while, then I wasn't in Moose, then I'd be in Stereo Lab for a while. But um, 
Then, because um, you had in the eighties, you had been in for a bit this mortal coil, hadn't you? As well, you yeah. Of, did you play on song to the siren at all? Yeah, we. I mean, we. <laughs> I. I know, um, saw Modern English play in New York, and we did Sixteen and Gathering Dust, which was two early songs, and we did them together as an encore. And um, Ivo uh, thought, oh, this is quite interesting. We we should um, record these two songs as a 12-inch. And it it didn't happen for us. And then Ivo decided that he'd um, form, get people on 4AE to do it. So me and Gary and Robin and Liz from The Cocktoes and Martin from Colourbox did a we recorded those songs and Ivo had already come up with the name This Mortal Coil yes. and uh, it was kind of, you know it, you know, it, it was average and then um, Ivo uh, later on you know a couple of months later came uh, did um, Songs of the Siren with Robin and, and Liz and that, that was supposed to be the B side <laughs> but of course <laughs> You know, it was, uh, okay, so obviously this song is um, an amazing piece of music. So that became, uh, you know, the A-side and the thing that, you know, took off for um, this mortal coil, you know, became, I mean, it was an amazing song, you know, really it was the Cocteau Twins, but as this mortal coil. Yes. Did the Cocteau Twins enjoy that experience? Did did Robin and Liz enjoy it or did they... (laughs) Well, I mean, I mean, I, I, I think, um, you know, it, it was. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's nice to kind of have been part of it, but at the time, it was, uh, you know, a, 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 a bit strange. It must have been a bit weird for Robin and Liz because, um, you know, it, this song was um, that they, they didn't really have any control over, and Robin, it kind of like was, you know, hundred percent in control of the Cocteau Twins. And yes. he managed everything that they did. And uh, suddenly there was this song with him and Liz, you know, being played all over the place and, um, uh, you know, ha- having a life of its own. And so uh, yeah, Robert and I, uh, uh, they always had a bit of a funny relationship towards the end anyway. But, um, you know, I think, um, you know, Robin would look at kind of, you know, think about how many copies has this sold and why haven't I got any money for it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's the usual. So then, it's it. yeah, so on that 90s period, you'd been in Muse and uh, Stereo Lab. Then, then what happens after that? Because do you, do you still sort of manage to navigate sort of flipping in and out of bands? No, um, <clears throat> for... Then I had a, a a very long period where I mean I've, I've been going to AA now for fifteen years. Yes, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, <clears throat> I um uh, so I've just outed myself. I um uh, after um the Moose and Stereo Lab thing, I uh, uh you know I I basically kind of um stopped uh playing music for quite a long period of time and then it was only uh, <clears throat> about 15 years ago when i um decided that okay this is i'm still alive so i might as well you know uh uh stop drinking and uh then i um uh i lived in london for all of this period you know i'm still friends with uh russell to really uh you know my best friend and then and scab Steve from Colorbox, you know they we were still mates. It's it's just that we weren't playing music anymore. We were just kind of like hanging out and drinking, and um, you know, very clever. But then I um, stopped drinking and um, uh, uh, started going to AA, and they um, everyone in AA said don't do anything crazy for the first year. Just go to meetings. Mm-hmm. And then as soon as uh, my first year was up, I uh, decided to uh, buy a boat and uh, move to Woodbridge in Suffolk, which I kind of knew I had some friends there. Anyway, and I went to school in Ipswich, Wolverston, and my mum and dad in Colchester. So I kind of um, <clears throat> went there 
And then um, it was, again, Russell from Moose, who used to come here all the time, and Robbie lived in Alborough and Thailand, and uh, uh, Russell, he, he's, he, he was um, the person who said, you two should uh, uh, start uh, playing music again together. And uh, so, so that was 15, 14 years ago. So then I rang up um, Steve Walker, the keyboard player, and I had to find Gary. He lived, he'd been living in Thailand for about 25 years. Yes. So I, I had to kind of like track him down. And when, when I first got in touch with him on the phone, he um, actually denied that it, it was he who I was talking to. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so finally I got him, you know. So then we um, uh, uh, basically uh, reconvened, you know, after, um, you know, 15 or 20 year gap. Cheesy, greasy. Yeah. So when you finished playing music, which was like, was that 76, 77, 96, 97 time? Was that when you said you stopped playing music and then hit the drinking until 15 years ago when you decided you needed to do something about it? Did yeah. I get, did I write? So was that, was that just yeah, a really yeah. lost period between the mid, late 90s? Yeah, yeah. to? Yeah, yeah, pretty much, yeah. Because you know, uh... I always remember David Bowie saying that he and I think Tony Visconti used to go to AA meetings and when someone mentioned yeah. about having a drink, he would say, well, I'm an alcoholic, and they would go, but you're not. And it's like, no, I am an alcoholic. That's why I have to go to meetings and I can't just have one drink. It doesn't work like that. It's it's more, you know, <laughs> people don't understand that one drink thing, do they? And actually, Ken's the same. When I did that when what interview with Ken from Wasted Youth, he had exactly the same story about alcohol and also heroin addiction, but that's another... I mean, um, we, we, we did a tour with Wasted Youth when I was, oh, like, eight. Yeah, the whole lot. I mean, it was that was the first tour we ever did when uh, we did our... our um, second four AD single. So, you know, from being an 18-year-old to being in a van with them, you know, wasted juice, you cer I certainly uh, had my eyes opened. <laughs> you know, the, you know, I thought, I, I only thought kind of people like Mick Jagger and Keith Richards could afford drugs. It was like, no, anyone, you know, if you, if, if you, if you want to get them, you can. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yes, no, it's yeah. not good. But Rocco, Rocco, no. Yeah, I Rocco's got, they've got the band back and they're doing some material and live dates. Yeah, and yeah. also, um, yeah, yeah. he makes glasses, which is just beautiful, which I thought was That's amazing. Right. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. I, I, I mean, I've, I've been um, friends with, you know, Rocco for, um, you know, forever. He's, you know, they're just, I mean, you know, so, I mean, some some people aren't here anymore, but, um, you know, like my mate Scab from Colorbox, he died. And uh, when I, um, uh, you know, he's my oldest friend from boarding school. But when I um, stopped drinking, I had this mission to kind of like go and save my friends. You know, and uh, Steve, uh, you know, I tried to get him to move to Woodbridge to buy, a, live on a boat, come to AA meetings with me. But he um, just couldn't get it. And then about four years later, he died, you know, from a you know, just drinking himself to death. But. Yeah, there's no surrenders, actually. But then, did you, I don't, I might have got this wrong, did you fill in at one stage with Lush? Did you have a Lush connection? Yeah, did... yeah, yeah. That was so, about... Um, was that uh, when they had reformed again on their American festival and they were being sort of, um, yes, they had some big dates in America, Coachella and such places. So you sort of filled in for Phil at one for their kind of latter half of their tour? Uh, no, I did the very last concert. Of the, oh, the, I mean, at, at Manchester. I, again, that was Russell from Moose, who, um, you know, he seems to be, he, he he's, plays a very big part in my life, in my music. He, um, I mean, I because I, I was, Mickey is married to Moose, you know, yes. the, um, that band, and um, then uh, Phil had, didn't I don't know what happened. They had a bit of fallout, and so I um stood in and played uh, the last. I and mean, I learned twenty three songs, and played one concert. You know, it was a hell of a lot of learning to do. And then um 
uh, that that's how um, Proshka the, the the came about. Me, Justin, who was in Lush at the time, the original drummer from Elastica, he um, uh, me, him, and Mickey spent a lot of the time in rehearsals, learning the doing the Lush stuff, <coughs> and Emma. The other guitar player would. She only came to about two or three rehearsals. There was obviously stuff going on in that band, but um, we had, you know, it was such good fun that um, we knew that the band was going to split up after my one and only gig, and uh, that's when. Uh, I don't know, don't get me in your band because you'll <laughs> you'll finish. But um, <laughs> but um, then we um, decided that. Uh, you know, we had so much fun. We should form a, another group, you know, like yes. kind of side side project. And, um, you know, Moose was like the obvious choice for guitar playing. You know, I've made so many records with Moose as well. But um, then, uh, you know, Piroshka, uh happened, and, which was, you know, it was good fun. It was like kind of, um, you know, middle-aged people uh, enjoying each other's company with friends. I mean, I'd known Mickey forever as well. Yes. So um, yes, it was a bit like an indie supergroup, really, wasn't it? I know. I know. I, I, well, you know, it, it, yeah. It, it, for want of a better word, you know. But uh, you know, when you think of supergroup, you always think of someone from Asia joining a, a band with someone from Supertramp. You know, but <laughs> all cream like ginger and ginger baker and uh eric you, yeah, you know yeah. that that was your yeah, first yeah. in it was super group really wasn't it cream so so it's a sort of yeah. a, an equivalent yeah. and you were on the bella bella union which was part of that whole world of the copto twins as well it was simon's label isn't it yeah 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 i mean i mean it was um we we actually uh, I mean I noticed you'd uh, interviewed Mickey recently. Yes, well. with her book as well. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, so we so just, as a guitarist, you, like you've been like you've got this one gig. Don't blow it. This is the last gig probably Lush will ever play. I mean, how do you learn the the kind of the whole repertoire and all the bass lines? Do you think mm, can we just kind of can I just keep it beast? You know, I mean, what is the process with that? Oh wow! I mean, with um, I mean, I played in quite a few bands, so um, but I take notes, you know, I listen to all of the all of the songs, and um, <clears throat> you know, write down all of the set. This is what I learned from Hugh Jones, and that's kind of like, I mean, I I can't write music, so it's just how to deconstruct the song onto a piece of paper, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, uh, because Mickey and Emma they wrote all of the songs themselves you know they didn't write together they wrote separately so then i got those two to um send me what they played on the guitar as well and listening to the uh, records and um you know for i made a playlist and for about i did have about a month to get the whole thing together and i i basically just everywhere i went i was listening to um lush you know, to, until it was like totally embedded. And um, I uh, did about five rehearsals. And, um, you know, be, because I kind of practiced at home or like worked out all of the song at home, you know, it was, it was okay. I mean, they, they um, uh, both of them are um, absolutely incredible. I mean, it was like amazing songwriters, you know, and it's like they do things that, uh, uh, normal musicians would never do. So I, with, I mean, this is getting a bit muso here, but with Emma, she'd uh, randomly just once in a song put in a C sharp, you know, that only happens once. You know, and it's like to the listener, you might not even notice it. But, you know, when you're kind of like digging into the music, you think, you know, it's like, I don't, you know, it, it was did just, you, did, to me, it was an amazing experience. Yeah. Did you, doing that sort of have more of an appreciation of Phil's guitar you know bass playing I mean did you think blimey I didn't realize there was quite so much in the indie you know indie pop band yeah yeah I mean it was I mean so I mean when when you're a bass player it's um you know you know most of it is about feel you know and it's like no two bass players will ever sound exactly the same because you know it's like no two drummers will sound the same but um 
you know, with um, uh, you know, with uh, Phil, he he's <coughs> he, he, you know, Mickey and Emma will you know will say they were the bass lines as well, but it was like how they sound on the record, and I was you know trying to make it sound exactly like um uh phil you know I, I, so, you know there was um you know i mean lush fans are quite um fanatical as well you know yes I, I thought you know they so there was like this kind of like short bloke suddenly appearing at their last gig you know i didn't i kind of i had my notes on music on a music stand and kind of stood next to um uh justin and then halfway through the gig mickey made a comment about the bass player and uh it was uh, uh, you know all i thought oh god you know mickey she's uh you know uh quite um you know she can suddenly say something that will like uh you know half the room will laugh their heads off and the other half will think oh i say <laughs> <laughs> Yes, anyway, that was the, that was, yeah, that would be one of those pop quiz questions, wouldn't it, really, about the last Lush gig and who was the bass player, because everyone would go, Phil King, no, that's wrong. Yeah, 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 you've yeah, yeah. You've lost a million pound, never mind. So then what does that, um, what, so where are you now in the terms of your kind of musical kind of movement, your next move, <coughs> your next move? Okay, but so uh, we've just, um, uh, finished recording a, a new Modern English album. I mean, Modern English have been playing consistently in America for um, <clears throat> probably about ten years. You know, it's, uh, we. Um, I mean, a couple of a couple of months ago, we were on the Jimmy Fallon show, which is like in America is like a big deal. It's like um, uh, uh, like being on the Wogan show yes. kind of thing. Uh, so there's still. Um, uh, you know, we still, you know, tour a lot. We um, played um, uh, a couple of years ago. We did a tour with The Alarm in America, which is good fun. We played with those, like, decades ago. Um, <clears throat> so we've just done, done a, a new LP with a guy called Mario McNulty that, oh, in the studio, not far from He, there. he, he remixed some of those David Bowie albums from the 80s, didn't he? And he took out that 80s production. So was there he? Was he? Mm-hmm. You've worked with all of them, haven't you? Because you worked with, um, yeah, Christ, not John Porter. Who was the other person you recorded with? In was it Pillow Lips? You had some. Yeah. Oh, Pat uh, Collier as well. Pat Collier. Pat Collier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, but with um, uh, Mario, he, um, uh, our manager, that uh, got me in touch with him, and. Uh, uh yeah uh, i mean he um he he did loads of stuff with bowie he was kind of like bowie's uh um you know engineer and he did that one album never let me down again or something like that. he re-recorded an entire bowie record after bowie died he, yeah you know left instructions for him but one thing about Mario that, um, as a matter of fact, right now, well, um, I I was listening to, he's sending me mixes. He's in New York City uh, mixing. But uh, he started off by, um, uh, he was um, uh, Philip Glass's uh, engineer. He he was an intern for Philip Glass and ended up working on, Le- who I totally love, he ended up working on loads of glass records. And then Philip Glass had this studio called the Glass House in New York. And uh, she used to share with David Bowie. Right. So um, he he kind of like engineered Philip Glass and then engineered Bowie's demos. And then <clears throat> he just kind of went off and started working with, um, uh, you know, all of these uh, Bowie people. I must admit, I first met Mario, uh, we had lunch in New York, and uh, it was almost like I was interviewing him for, um, you know, uh, you know. Okay, so tell me how this happened. You know, I wanted to know about how all of the things that had happened on these records that I really liked, <laughs> how they came about. You know, it's like kind of like a fanboy in a way. Yes. But, um, no, he, but, but the thing he, is, sorry, I was going to say, did he? I kind of remember now. Did he go to Bowie's 
flat or house in New York and sort of set up a studio so he could sort of yeah. keep recording even yeah. towards his latter years. I hope you asked him about Bowie's kitchen and interior decor. <laughs> I, I, yeah, yeah, I did. I mean, he's, I mean, Matt, I mean, when, um, you know, the crazy thing is when you work with these kind of people, like, you know, Bowie and all that, they all have to sign non disclosure agreements. Yes. Yeah, so, true. you know, uh, it, you know, I, I've, I've known Mario now for a couple of years, and, uh, you know, he, um, you know, occasionally he'll say, you know, oh, yeah, David gave me that book. You know, and I think, oh, okay, because you know he was a great reader, David Bowie, and yes. Mario was quite young when I first met him, and I think he, um, you know, he uh, just the, the way he, Bowie seems to have been quite generous, you know, and um, you know, giving uh, you know this young New York kid, you know, the, all of these books to read, listen to this music, check out, you know, I mean, it's. You know, there's not many people that you meet in New York that look like Mario and they'll say their favourite record of all time is um, Taking Tiger Mountain by Storm, you know, quite an obscure Eno album. <laughs> you know, and, but, but having said that, he, um, you know, when you start your musical um, career with, with Philip Glass, you know, I mean, some of the things he told me about how Philip Glass records got put together were um, really kind of uh, mind-blowing. You know, and I thought, wow, you know, if, if he can work with, in those conditions, he can certainly work with, you know, old geezers like modern English, you know, without <laughs> too much other book. But one, yeah. one thing about working with Mario, and that um, I, I'll just say this, is that, uh, not, you know, it, I've done, uh, uh, you know, worked with loads of different people, but we, before I used to be, uh, well, with Mario, it's a bit like, you go into the studio, record, and it was a bit like a um, Spacewood. You'd get the performance and come back in. And, you know, in those days, you had 12 hours. So it was like, does anyone notice that mistake I made there? And if, you know, if people say, no, I can't hear it, just carry on. You know, we, there was no kind of like, uh, you know, it's quite common to go to a studio and make a record and spend four hours listening to a bass line on its own or yeah. a hi-hat or a kick drum. We didn't do any of that. It was just like, sit back, listen to the whole thing and think, okay, that's good. Let's move on to the next song. And that, you know, I did say to Mario, is that how, you know, the next day was made? He said, yeah, you know, it was like, there was no, you know, no soloing of anyone's parts so you could hear what they were playing. It's just if it all sounds good as a band, just carry on. God, that's a relief, so. isn't it? You must have thought, oh, okay, I'll... that's good. We'll do that. I know there's some, yeah, it's it's interesting. But also I expect you probably admired his amazing perfect teeth as well. Let's face it. Whenever you, <laughs> whenever you, whenever I interview Americans, I, I do have a bit of teeth in me and, um, I don't know. You know what it's like, isn't it? You know, it's a cliche, but it's true. You just think, Jesus, that's how did you get those to be so perfect? <laughs> Not wasting I know, and listen I know, to bass. I know. <laughs> I know I've seen pictures. I, of how, I mean, I mean, I mean, living here, it's like, I, I don't know how they do it because you know, it's like we they don't have an NHS here. You know, going to the doctors is uh, you know, in, people spend so much money on their medical insurance and all that stuff here is well actually yeah. i did an interview yesterday with a guy from new york who was in the richard hell band ivan julian who yeah, you yeah. Know, and um yeah, yeah, he, yeah. he told me that um when he got diagnosed for cancer he didn't you know didn't have any money and it was just like i'm afraid you're gonna have to die but then you know luckily he managed to somehow persuade it but it was like jesus that's that is just unbelievable if if you haven't got your insurance already sorted out before you get uh, you know the the diagnosis and the results yeah, you're a yeah. bit you're a bit up the you know up the creek really so yeah it was it was kind of you know it was 2015 he suddenly had that experience so um yes yes we we take it for granted the nhs but yeah it's uh, quite fortunate you know. no, completely but and, and you know and right now like um you know here you know the tories have been in power now for 12 years and it's like they're um you know wondering why um you know the NHS is in such a bloody, you know, state. It's like, well, you know, you can't blame, 
you know, nurses <laughs> for, um, you know, what's going on, <laughs> you know. It's no. like, I mean, I mean yeah, recently I heard someone, on, it's insane, you know, being here, but, um, you know, someone was saying that his, his daughter is four months old and in that time she's seen off um, three prime ministers and uh, one monarch, you know, there's <laughs> like, you know, in four months there's like a new king and three different prime ministers. I know, it's kind of cra- crazy world. So look, if you could have whispered something to your 16-year-old self starting out, is there any little bits of advice you would have given them that would have made you think, even if that person had ignored you, what would you what would you have said? Um, God, well... Um, I don't. I, that's such a hard question. Uh, probably, I would have said, uh, and and I probably would have ignored it, and that would be um, study music theory a bit more, and uh, you know, learn to um, uh, read music as well. Yes, but <clears throat> you still managed to sort of get through all those bands and experiences <laughs> with, with great form. so just going to back to modern english with your new re- album did you say what label you're on or are you not on a label yeah uh, well we we, <clears throat> we we have our own label we um we released um uh so far we've released two albums we did an lp called take me to the trees about six years ago we did that in my studio in suffolk and then uh last year we did um a live uh, from the O2 version of um, After the Snow that we did during lockdown. Yeah. And so this new album is, um, uh, I mean, at the moment, it's, uh, we, you know, we, you know, we financed it ourselves. You know, we haven't actually played it to any, um, you know, other labels. I mean, I might um, uh, send the copy to Simon. <laughs> See what he <laughs> thinks. But, but, you know, there's, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's you know, we I haven't really, really thought about that at the moment. Well, you know, we're, when it's finished, and um, you know, I mean, we're, we're using uh, you know Vaughan Oliver, who did all of the artwork at Four AD. He died yes. about two, three years ago. But Chris, his um, you know, kind of like um, you know, uh, artistic partner, at the Vaughan Oliver V twenty three. He is doing our artwork. Chris did, um, you know, on the Rima Rima poster, you yeah, know, the, the film. If you, Chris is the person that did all of the uh, graphics, and um, you know, I can recognise Chris's work in it straight away. He's doing a, he he's doing our artwork now. So there's, you know, it still looks and sounds like a modern English record, but um, we, um, you know, a, a couple of years ago we. Um, um, at, we, we were able to re 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 we got our own publishing back and our own uh, copyright and our own music back from 4AD in America. So we own all of our um, uh, back catalogue as well. So you, you know, modern English is also a kind of like a, a mini business as well for us now. So um, we we it's. You know, we're not beholden to a record company. We can basically do what what we want. Yes. You know, when we want to do it as well. Which is amazing. And I'm guessing, though, you don't own the TVT record. Uh, Well, do you know what? We uh, are in the very process of getting that back as well. I mean, they went bankrupt, TVT records, and it's... uh, Seems to me it's owned by someone uh, called The Orchard right now. And um, we, uh, we, we, we will be owning it. I mean, we even own Stop Star as well. You know, we, all, all of our records we own now. Uh, Pillow Lips will definitely be returning to the canon. Whether I will let anyone know about it, I don't know. <laughs> 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 yes, it's always it's always tricky. So that's good. You're on Spotify. Do you have Bandcamp as well, and all those other sites that people can? We do. I, I, you're you're talking to the modern English social media person here as well, but uh, uh, and I I do all of this stuff, but um, I don't. Um, 
I don't put I don't really put much on band camp, you know, quite often there's so much going on that um I forget, you know, that um, you know, I haven't been on band camp for a while or done anything there. That I think there is some stuff. I haven't looked at band camp for ages. Yeah. I have to say, but Apple Music, we're on, we're on Spotify. I mean, it, it's you know, uh, basically, it's like the thing that keeps the whole thing going is I melt with you. you know, yeah. If, if the figures for on Spotify for I melt with you are quite, you know, pretty good. Eye watering. That is amazing, isn't it? That is really fantastic. Yeah. Well, look, thank you yeah. ever so much for this. This has been amazing. And if you want, I can always um send you the link and then you could use it on one of your social media platform sites because you've got all of them, haven't you? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. This is absolutely. Good. Yeah, that's been brilliant. Well, thank you ever so much for this. This has been really no, exciting. And I'm so pleased you've got a boat in Woodbridge. And you can <laughs> and you can listen to some classical concerts just up the road, can't you? In dear old uh, Snape. I love it. Yeah, Snape Moldings, amazing place. We we um uh, modern English have so far we we done two uh, Benjamin Britain, you know, every year they have the uh, Benjamin Britain Festival. Yes. And uh, they we we played a couple of them. It's you know it's always good fun. We uh you know we have a, a kind of rehearsal place in Aldborough as well. So uh, you know we're um you know part of you know part of the local kind of like that. Oh look, there's another bunch of musicians walking around. It's it's a lovely place, Aldborough. Oh God, it must be beautiful. Yeah, and I've been you know often I head to Walberswick. Sometimes Southwold, that kind of direction, you know, Dunwich. Very nice. You can't, you know, it's just perfect, isn't it, really? We're lucky, so yeah. there you go. But anyway, look, thank you ever so much. This has been amazing. Yeah, and uh, have a great day. I will do. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. And that was me in conversation with Michael Conroy, sometimes known as Mick. But there you go. Anyway, that's Modern English. If you want to find out any more information, go to their website, which is Modern English dot m e there you go but just google it it's fine and they have uh, as i said lots of shows coming up and other bits and pieces so anyway that's it this has been the c86 show david east so if you want to contact me you can on facebook twitter instagram just do c86 show all these have been archived aren't you lucky so you can find those on spotify itunes podbeam anyway have a great week stay safe <laughs>